thank you for attending this press conference. We are, of course, going through terrible times. Given the importance of science in handling the pandemic and preparing for the future, the science community was hoping that research would be a top priority both in the next framework program and the recovery plan. Unfortunately, this is not the case. At best, the budget for Horizon Europe, which was proposed by the Council on July 20, is stagnant and may actually be lower in 2021 than 2020. The young researchers will not even have access to next generation EU funds. In this press conference, we will precisely focus on the impact both of COVID-19 and the future budget on young researchers who have been particularly hit by the circumstances that we have been living through. Our first speaker is Giulia Malaguarnera. She's a life scientist originally from Italy. She got her PhD in Italy, was a postdoc at University College London, and then also in Italy, her field of research is life science, precisely the gut-brain axis. She is now a Marie Curie individual fellow working as R&D manager for Cherry Biotech, a microfluidic startup company in France. As one can see, she is a true European person. Julia is president of Eurodoc, the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers. Julia, I hand the speech to you. Thank you, Martin, for the kind presentation and thanks, uh, Ise, for organizing uh, this press conference. I'm here representing Eurodoc, the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, which is a grassroots federation of 20 eight national association in 25 countries across Europe. In 2017, Eurodoc has called on all European members and institutions for an increase of the budget for Horizon Europe, and in particular to the Marie Curie actions and the ERC budgets. These are both vital uh, to supporting early career researchers and sustain the implementation of open science in Europe. Unfortunately, we are here today to warn against the grave threat posed by potential cuts to investments in science and research during a pandemic. In our opinion, a cut to the research budget in this situation is devastating for early career researchers and their ability to foster excellence in Europe. In fact, the two aforementioned programs facing the cuts are European investments aimed to promote the career development of the researchers, not solely research projects. And in they are both setting the standard of research fundings at the national levels. This means that budget cuts may heavily impact early career researchers, either in contract extensions, increasing the ratio of short-term, part-time, partially funding research uh, increasing self-funded or unpaid positions. In the last months, Eurodoc members shared with us disturbing stories of the impact of COVID-19 in their lives and their works. These broadly reflect that at this stage of their careers, researchers have little security. PhD candidates are still considered students in most of the European countries, not employees. This means that they have a lack of social security in most of the European countries. Furthermore, postdoctoral researchers are typically employed through short-term project funding and not proper contracts, and they likely face losing their jobs amidst the crisis. Those researchers who are employed are unable to work during the pandemic and consequently publish their research. Moreover, the lack of an adequate working environment 
or a sustainable strategy to employ early career researchers, as well as the pressure from employers to publishing and be productive, has led early career researchers to very poor mental health. You have to think that just in Netherlands, roughly half of PhD candidates are considering to quitting their doctorates and they have increased risk of psychiatric disorders. Research with its social and economical benefits is nothing without the people who perform it. Act now by supporting early career researchers and preserving the long-term budget and investments in the next generation of Europe. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Julia. Maybe you could say a few words about maybe either your own situation or the situation of somebody that you know, to give an example to people who are attending of the kind of situation that they've been in. Yeah, we, we have collected the very um, sad stories. Uh, of course, uh, all uh, um, the researchers uh, that have a family have faced a lot of problem in uh, collecting uh, data for the research, accessing the laboratory or accessing the, the research field. Uh, in the case of the Marie Curie, which is uh, uh, one of, uh, of course, one of the best uh, uh, funding program, um, I still have uh, the security of uh, my funding, but I don't have extensions. It means that uh, most of my project will not uh, uh, be completed. Uh, as uh, I was thinking, uh, I had to change my project uh, and uh, the secondment based on the, the mobility and uh, the crisis that uh, is uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, moreover, uh, since I am a life scientist, uh, uh, in my project I was thinking to collect human samples and uh, this is, won't be possible during a pandemic. So many changes uh, had been done for uh, uh, helping me to complete the project, even if uh, not at the standard that uh, I was planning. And this is uh, one of the common story for most of uh, the researchers. Thank you, Julia. Quite striking. Now I, I, I will give the floor to Gemma Modino. She's a neuroscientist originally from Barcelona. She obtained her PhD in the Netherlands. She is a Henry, Sir Henry Dale Fellow at King's College London, working on neuroscientific methods and mental health. Gemma is vice chair of the Young Academy of Europe. Gemma, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Martin and ISC for organizing. Uh, following this compelling account shared by Eurodoc, I'm here today to report on the tangible impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on the research and careers of excellent young scholars across Europe. The Young Academy of Europe is a bottom-up initiative aiming to protect and improve the future of young researchers in Europe and to provide an independent voice by young scholars in European science policy. Uh, we currently have over 150 members across Europe. Our membership largely consists of researchers who have recently gained independence through prestigious European funding to lead and establish their own research vision. These researchers are at a critical point in their careers and what happens at this stage will very much determine their futures in academia. They got here because the, re the necessary resources were available to enable them to push the boundaries of scientific knowledge. Now the COVID-19 pandemic has put much of this progress on hold. It should be noted that many researchers at this stage have temporary positions, even when holding ERC or other prestigious grants, even when leading their own research group. So a delay in their research and or a freeze of research investment can block their career progression. And this damages science as a whole, not just the individuals. The Young Academy of Europe has been gathering data on the impact of the pandemic on early career researchers through a survey that has been running since the end of June. And the results are predictably quite disheartening. Let me share some data with you. So far, we've had a total of 123 respondents. 71% are within the first 10 years from their PhD award. 86% said that the pandemic has significantly delayed their research or publication progress. 
levels of stress have increased. During the pandemic, about 37% have been very stressed or even stressed to the point of burnout when compared to the time before the pandemic. Levels of motivation have decreased. About 73% answered that due to the pandemic, they feel less motivated, less able to focus, or that the pandemic was a trigger for them to rethink their career significantly. Now, one of the most striking findings is that the pandemic has exacerbated inequalities. Those worst affected by the pandemic are women, people with children and caring responsibilities, and researchers in smaller institutions. For example, 70% of women versus 7% of men considered quitting their careers due to difficulties faced during the pandemic. And finally, we've also seen that the effects of the pandemic on researchers depend on country, right? Different lockdowns, different policy responses to the impacts of the pandemic on research and on research fields. So whether it's more lab-based or theoretical. Taken together, it's clear that the shutdowns caused by the pandemic have generated a great deal of professional and emotional distress to young scholars. Having to worry about whether their contract will be extended or they can get a new job in the near future, on top of an unsettling amount of uncertainty around their research being on hold, adds additional mental strain for this group who are already at a stressful career stage. Back in April, when the pandemic was emerging, uh, YAE board member Ariel Tusby and myself published a letter in Nature to highlight that early career researchers were at particular risk following the COVID-19 pandemic. We called for stronger and more explicit commitment from European institutions to warranty costed extensions to early career researchers in order to secure the delivery of their funded research programs. Extensions would be tailored to each case. Of course, we have seen that the survey the different groups have been affected differently. We are well aware that the situation we are facing is equally unprecedented for institutions and for funders. However, supporting ECRs, who are the future of our research landscape, will ensure the prosperity of European um, research portfolios in the post-pandemic world. And this is why we strongly encourage research funding bodies to candidly engage with and support ECRs during this difficult time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, very quickly, I give the floor to Mustafa Munir. He is specialist of nanotechnology. He is originally from Bangladesh, where he obtained his Bachelor of Science. He then came to Europe, getting his Master of Science in Twente in the Netherlands, worked at Université Catholique de Louvain before getting his PhD at the Technical University of Vienna. Actually, this is, a, he is in a way, a symbol of what the Marie Curie program does is to attract excellent scientists from all over the world. He recently moved to industry. He is the vice chair of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much, ISC, for organizing this and this opportunity. Today, I'm here representing as the chair of Marie Curie Alumni Association with nearly 17,000 members across 143 countries. As a representative of researchers from all career stages and diverse background, I'd like to focus on five different aspects impacted by the proposed budget cut in Horizon Europe. So first, let's focus on the proposed amount. Looking at the absolute number, one might feel that more money compared to previous years is being provided for research and innovation. In reality, looking at the growing demand and supply ratio in current times, the budget is not enough. In fact, the budget was not enough in Horizon 2020 to mitigate climate changes. It was not enough to prepare Europe for healthcare challenges. And now, added to that, the new reality posed by the pandemic, the need for new knowledge, new technology, and new ways of doing things are greater than ever. To meet this need, we have to invest maximum possible amount for research and innovation. Now, the second point would be the connection to wider society. Over the past 20 years, more than 140,000 researchers have benefited from programs like Mary Skodolska Reaction. Taking a focused look at the societal impact of MSCA, it is clear that the beneficiaries of this program have became knowledge leaders, top researchers, and excellent innovators 
to provide our society with novel and much needed solutions for the challenges we face in our daily lives. We still have many more challenges ahead of us, including pandemic, climate change, and the fourth industrial revolution. Considering this, Europe's success lies in the hands of a growing research workforce. And now let's focus on the third point, which is job. How research funding and therefore research and innovation impact industry to create business and new jobs are not always clearly visible and not always clearly communicated within the mass media. Between 2014 and 2018, MSCS supported over 2,600 companies, supporting 7,500 jobs. Among them, over 1,100 companies are small and medium enterprises, or SMEs. Now, this proposed budget cut, which is 25%, will estimate it that about 2,000 jobs will not exist in the next years. So let's focus on the fourth point, which is gender equity. With targeted support, the male and female ratio within MSCA program is 60 to 40. But not only that, 47% of research coordinators are female, which is much better than 33% in other, other horizon uh, 2020 programs. Last but not the least, let's focus on the diplomacy. All inclusiveness is a core value of the MSCA program. With the support of MSCA, talents from all over the world come together with the European researcher to find solutions of our problem. If we learn one thing from this pandemic, this working together of world scientists is key to survival. Across the border, it cre creates lasting relationships and a platform for diplomacy. And I assume we all can agree that diplomacy, research, and innovation is a much better way of solving problems. Keeping all these points in mind, I would strongly request all of you to raise your voice and appeal to the stakeholders and policymakers that please do not reduce the research and innovation budget in the upcoming program. Fund us and let us do what we do best, find solutions to our problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mustafa. I think we've had a very moving testimonies by the three young researchers. Uh, now I will let give the floor to the more senior researchers who probably lead, need less of an introduction. The first speaker will be Jean-Pierre Bourguignon. He's a mathematician from France. He's the previous president and president at interim of the European Research Council. Jean-Pierre, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you for the initiative for Science in Europe, ISC, to take this uh, initiative of uh, this uh, press conference. Actually, um, as uh, ERC past president and uh, interim president, I must recall the very critical role that IEC played in the creation of the ERC. So I think we heard from young researchers, actually, indeed, how uh, they are really especially hit and the research altogether is also hit by the pandemic, but also in the present situation, which is uh, unprecedented, as we heard, and, and we are all aware, the uh, politicians really are, have a lot of difficulty to take a long-term view because uh, indeed there are really some pressing issues which uh, need to be addressed and create a lot of uncertainties. Nevertheless, I think uh, in particular in the context of uh, the European uh, policy, which is uh, having framework programs of seven years of length, it is absolutely critical that uh, this long-term view prevails. And this is why uh, for me, it was completely uh, impossible to understand how the uh, summit in July came up with a, such a cut for Horizon Europe. Horizon Europe, as you know, has uh, several components, three pillars, as we call them, and also some kind of horizontal um, support. But for, for the three pillars, of course, their nature is quite different. Pillar one, which, in which both the Marislav Zuskakuri actions are located, and the ERC, together with the large infrastructures, is definitely the one where there is the most concentration for bottom-up 
program because uh, the uh, Marisol Scarpuri actions support in particular mobility. ERC is dedicating two thirds of its um, budget to researchers who are below the age of 40. So it's a very considerable uh, impact on early career researchers. And we know that uh, this budget has to be uh, improved. And it is not possible that we are in the situation of stagnation for the support of these activities. But this, uh, the particular issue, which has been also mentioned by several of the speakers from the um, earlier career researchers uh, organizations, is also very important about the disruption that it uh, brought to their activities and the need for the, uh, for the funders to take this properly into account, which means in particular, uh, really providing appropriate extensions and taking into account also the impact on the ambition of the project when the people couldn't access their labs or couldn't uh, gather the data necessary for their work. So I think we are at ERC very much aware. Uh, ERC has been extremely flexible to allow researchers to adapt their project from a scientific point of view, but also we have to, we know we have to monitor very closely the very direct impact on, on the research activities and really on the completion of the work. Thank you very much for this opportunity, but clearly we all have to be mobilized for this uh, fight for the budget and also for proper, um, properly taking into account the impact of the COVID uh, crisis. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. I now give the floor to Francesco Sete. He's a physicist from Italy. Uh, presently the Director General of the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble. Francesco. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity uh, to talk at this, um, at this, uh, this meeting, at this gathering. <clears throat> so um, I um, want to uh, bring my um, point of view from a, slide, a slightly different uh, perspective, um, a research infrastructure, in particular international research infra infrastructure, big um, instruments that exist to enable science. Uh, the ESOF specifically is, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, is possible thanks to the cooperation of 22 countries that goes even beyond Europe and uh, 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 addresses uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the very, very key questions uh, that uh, are at the, uh, uh, at, the, at the frontier of science, but also extremely relevant for the ad peaceful advancement of our society. Areas like uh, climate change, health, energy, uh, microelectronics, and so forth. Um, and is absolutely uh, vital to recognize that uh, the fundamental uh, part of this research is uh, strongly linked to the ability of young researchers to uh, participate, uh, to uh, uh, contribute, uh, to develop their career, to develop their um, uh, love for science, and also uh, in this atmosphere, of open opportunities that are provided by a research infrastructure that typically gathers thousands of researchers every year, also to address many other aspects like diversity, multicultures, and so on. So um, it is clear that today we are facing this, um, this in, in unexpected and uh, extremely challenging uh, situation of the COVID-19 and uh, uh, everybody has been called to adapt to this new situation uh, uh, in a very, very short time. So uh, we are all uh, trying to do our best to maintain our capacity uh, to do science and to transfer science to industry and uh, to the uh, creation of new jobs and at the end to the uh, better being of our society. Um, it was said, uh, bring people uh, to solve our problems. I see it as slightly different. I think uh, one should uh, uh, 
bring people in order to solve problems for everybody. The openness beyond frontiers is a fundamental aspect. And this is one of the key elements on which we need to invest in order to maintain a strong capacity to do science. And of course, the fuel of doing science is the motivation of the young generations, the young researchers. So we must have a strong program to support young researchers, especially during these times. But a strong problem, a program is not only the direct support of the young researchers, is also to ensure that all the aspects that enable research, meaning the education pipeline, the um, national and international infrastructure where research is carried out, need to be supported and preserved. So the COVID-19 is telling us is that uh, through openness and through knowledge that we will go through this pandemic. And therefore, a strong effort in this direction is mandatory for the well-being of our society, of Europe, about, of the whole world, in which uh, Europe is playing, uh, I think, an excellent example with its openness and hopefully a return from this openness that has been already greatly demonstrated by the ERC. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. <clears throat> I'm very honored to present our last speaker, Lina Galvez Munoz. She's a member of the European Parliament from Spain and vice chair of the ITRE committee. Prior to becoming an MEP, she was a professor at the Pablo Olivade University in Sevilla. Please, Lina, I give the floor to you. So thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, event. I really honor and because it's a uh, subject that touched me really a lot, not only because of my ongoing responsibility as vice chair of uh, the ITRE committee at the European Parliament, but also because as you said, uh, up to last year, I was uh, a researcher myself, not a young researcher anymore, but um, still I'm uh, linked to my PhD and postdoc uh, uh, researchers, and I know how difficult it is in this moment the struggle they are going through, uh, and also some of them, most of them women, uh, as you have said before, Gemma, I think I said before, are thinking on on, on quitting, on just uh, stopping. Uh, their their scientific career, which is very sad for me because I've been with them for, for many times. So um, as you can imagine, um, I, I'm quite disappointed um, of the, by the outcome of the Council conclusions last July, uh, which uh, significantly reduced the envelope of Horizon uh, Europe compare both to commissions and especially to the parliament um, position. I think, as we all know, the uh, European Council are the major setback for a European Union that wants both to recover from the crisis and to prepare a sustainable and competitive future for all its citizens and the next uh, generation. And they are saying they want to do an, in an inclusive um, Okay. Of course, at the European Parliament, we don't want to see any delay in the start of the program, but we will use our prerogative as co-legislators uh, co in order to get the necessary uh, resources, in order to, to, to advance in, in research frontier, knowledge-based innovation to achieve all the, the, the common goals we have, the ecological, the digital transitions, uh, of course, for amel ameliorating people's um, uh, well-being. Uh, um, we want to call for a strong financial commitment, which is now now uh, in the in the table. We need uh, a program uh, that is ambitious, not only in its scope but also in its uh, funding. It was last uh, in the RNI days uh, on on Thursday. I was with uh, with a few of the research ministers, and I was really very very much uh, insisting on on that because it's kind of unbelievable that uh, now that science is proving how important it is in order to get out of this uh, pandemic and how um, society is now uh, supporting it. Uh, now we are cutting the budget on, on, on science. It's really um, 
unbelievable. And um, and also because we know that the comparative advantage of Europe in a global world does not lie in its demographic strength or in cheap labor force, it lies on knowledge. Um, so if we have been aiming at transforming Europe towards a greener, digital, healthier, a more equal future, we really need to rely on Europe's researchers to provide the talents, ideas, and projects necessary to make this happen and make it with dignity, which is something lacking still for many young uh, researchers. We cannot abandon them now. We cannot abandon you uh, uh, now. Um, we know that too many of uh, Europe's two million researchers face precarious conditions and uncertain futures, especially younger researchers. Um, we have seen the data presented today uh, that this crisis is, is affecting them uh, very, uh, very much, and we cannot afford to lose any of the talents in 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 our um, society. Um, because I always like uh, to say that talents are equally distributed, but opportunities uh, are not. Um, just for finishing, we um, we must also remember, this is also very much linked with the research infrastructure that are needed this uh, beyond borders uh, in order to develop and to invest in this research infrastructure that uh, don't know of, of borders uh, in order to uh, researchers can accomplish the, the research. We must also remember that our reform of the European research area is imminent. We are expecting probably this, this week to have the file and that the reform of researchers career is much needed. And the current council proposal for R&D budget would not help in this endeavor. We need to look further than the short term and invest in our best minds in order to transition to the future we want for us and for future generations. Therefore, we have a duty as a public sector to give the tools needed to others the big challenges ahead of us and which investment and opportunities to support the next generation of researchers and innovators. We hope that the Council and the Commission will remember that science, research and innovation are needed to reach fair, more resilient and sustainable development. The future of research and innovation continue to be key for citizens' well-being. Be assured that from the European Parliament and from the ITER Committee in particular, we will continue to push forward research and innovation as a priority in the European political agenda. However, it's not going to be easy. I'm not saying here it's going to be easy. Um, um, it, uh, the, the Horizon Europe is, is, is a competitive uh, program. And it is, in my opinion, is always the, the, the easiest way to cut. Uh, in such a program, unfortunately. But as uh, someone was saying before, this is uh, not uh, only um, a, a personal pain for many uh, researchers, especially young researchers, but it's also a collective pain because we cannot uh, afford it as a society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lina. Now I will take a few of the questions. We have about a bit more than 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, the questions that we will not be able to answer, maybe you can send them to us uh, uh, privately and then we will try to, to respond. There are several questions. I, I will not quote who, who is giving the question. There are several questions which, which are about the issue. So what do the organizations, what do the organizations of scientists plan to do to change the situation? So perhaps we have uh, Gemma or Mustafa or Julia, could you say something? Uh, if I may uh, go first. So actually the organizations are working together for quite some time. I mean, uh, Young Academy of Europe and Eurodoc, not only on these issues, for example, we also work on open issues and other issues together. Uh, we were collaborating from the beginning and right now uh, MCAA supported the survey made by Eurodoc as well as the YAE. And as a next step, uh, we also had our own survey. We sent our recommendations already to the policymakers. So what we could do at this point, looking at the current scenario, is we could 
collaborate with the young researchers and we could basically make our voice heard to the policymakers. I see that there is a question about the concrete action. Uh, to be very honest, we, we are doing it and I think this is right now out of our hand. It is up to the policymaker. It is up to the institution. So I would support that the, or I would ask all the researchers to write to their uh, policymakers right to the institutions they are uh, working on so that they make their voice heard to the policymakers and go to the national level and then comes to the European uh, Commission or uh, European policy level. So this is like my understanding. If Gemma or Julia would like to. Yes, thanks Mustafa. So um, yes, I wholeheartedly um, endorse what Mustafa said to our organizations have been working together. Uh, and the, the, as a first step, as he also said, we aim to gather data to see what the input, impact is, is, is on our different organizations. So the researchers, early career, but at these different stages. And once we can quantify and we get some evidence of what the impact is, then we can make recommendations uh, to policymakers and, and take, it from, take it from there. Uh, but it's better to have this, this mass of data to base it on. Um, in order to make grounded recommendations. Yes, I can. Uh, I can uh, conclude. <laughs> of course, uh, I I endorse uh, both Gemma and Mustafa. Uh, we are a three organization uh, composed by early career researchers at any level. Um, yeah. So we first. We are working on uh, increasing the awareness of what is happening uh, for uh, the early career researchers during the pandemic. And this is very important because of course, not all are aware of uh, the precarity uh, issue that uh, we are facing. Second is to provide uh, and to communicate with uh, um, the research uh, institutes and the policy maker about uh, what could be the recommendation that we are discussing between uh, the three organizations, uh, listening also to other society. So feel free to contact us. Uh, and three, uh, we are also uh, pushing our members uh, in particular at the national levels or at local levels uh, to help us to voice the uh, problems that we are facing in this period. We are hoping uh, that uh, uh, we can find a solution uh, uh, for everybody to sustain our uh, careers and uh, our futures in Europe. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe I, I will add just one word. Generally speaking, the science, scientists have been, haven't been very good at voicing their preoccupations at the European level. And I think this is the, the general issue that we're facing with. A lot of organizations are working on this budget issue, university organizations, uh, us, of course, the young researchers organization, but the fact is that we have not been able to have our voices heard and the the situation is very urgent. We have just a few weeks to uh, address the issue. And perhaps actually this is one of the questions by David Larousserie from Le Monde. Uh, what is the next step of the negotiation? Is there a deadline? Maybe Jean-Pierre Bourguignon could answer this question. Thank you very much. Well, tomorrow there is a very important meeting of, uh, at the council level, which is the so-called Council of Competitiveness, uh, which uh, brings together all the ministers in charge of research. And this council is supposed under German presidency to come up with some kind of a position of the council on the structure and uh, also the ventilation of the budget of Horizon uh, Europe, which is a next framework program for the period 2021 to 2027. Then in the European system, you have the so-called trilogue, which have actually already started. Trilogue, why? Because you have to bring together the council the parliament and the commission to really come up with a common view so that in the end, the, the final document for Horizon Europe, for example, has to be voted by the parliament and then also approved by the various countries. And so the next key um, uh, trilogue is going to be held on the 6th of October. And there was the, normally the final one, which was planned for October 15th could be that this October 15 one is pushed 
in particular because uh, it's not clear that at the trilogue on the 6th of October, a final decision will be reached. That is, the three parties uh, are comfortable with, uh, with the compromise. So this is where we are. And of course, the, one of the, um, uh, I mean, one of the difficulty is that the next program is supposed to start on January 1st, which of course requires some technical doing before it's, uh, it can really start. And, and of course, the end of October was considered by many as really the, the deadline to really achieve a, really a satisfactory solution. For the moment, uh, it looks like the various uh, parties are quite far uh, apart and we have to see uh, what kind of uh, compromise can be found. Uh, many people are working very, very intensely, in particular on the side of the parliament, but I'm sure also on the German presidency side, they are also working very hard on the, on the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Obviously, it's a matter of weeks, right? It is a matter of weeks. There is one question, actually not so much a question, but a comment which I think is interesting about people who have funding, European funding, who are from outside of the European Union, who are now confronted with visa issues. They were not able to pursue their work correctly, so their conclusions are being delayed. And but they and they're in some cases they're even willing to work for free even if their contract is uh, finished but they cannot get the the visa extension which allows them to work which I think is a very very dramatic situation and we have a message from Gordana Durovic so I mean, this is an important issue is for instance that the ERC confronted with such issues or. Well, you know, uh, one of the difficulty with uh, this, which is a very legitimate question, is the fact that uh, the visas are issued by countries. The European Union doesn't issue visa, the European Commission. So therefore, uh, the answer depends where you are and what is the decision which is taken locally uh, on these uh, visa issues. Uh, I'm sure that people understand uh, and, uh, that the situation is very special and then therefore requires a, a special attention. But it's very difficult to give uh, some kind of across the board uh, answer to the question, uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> Thank you. There are also quite a few comments which come probably from researchers who think that the structure, the organization of research is uh, problematic, that uh, the hierarchy between PIs and postdocs and doctoral students is not appropriate. I think this is not the immediate issue we're facing with an issue about the budget. I would try to point out that in in coordination with the other, with the members of IEC and other stakeholders, IEC is working on these issues and we hope to present some conclusions and proposals in the next few weeks or in the next few months. But I think that we're now focusing on the budgetary issue and on the immediate uh, problem of uh, young researchers and researchers in general faced with the COVID, with the COVID crisis. <clears throat> Maybe because I think we should reach uh, very soon a conclusion. Uh, 45 minutes is a good period for a press conference. Uh, I, maybe I will ask um, our uh, panelists to make one last comment, but I would like to say to all people who have questions which have not been addressed to write to us. The, the address will be written on, on the chat box and we will try to answer them in the next few days by transferring the question to whoever seems to be the most appropriate to, to answer the question. So maybe, uh, well, maybe Francesco, maybe could you make one last comment? <clears throat> I want to conclude uh, by uh, saying that is indeed a very, very complicated and complex uh, situation. And as uh, Jean-Pierre said it very properly, uh, uh, we are going to be facing in the coming weeks uh, uh, the need of important uh, uh, decision. And uh, one thing has to be kept in mind that uh, young researchers are the fuel of uh, 
society. In fact, the young generation is the fuel of society in, in every domain. So the highest uh, capital and the highest capacity that we have in order to uh, face a uh, crisis uh, with a medium and a long-term view is uh, by investing on the young generations. And therefore, is of primary importance to keep all those activities uh, that ensure to get the best for the future life of our young people being as strong as possible. Thank you. Julia, maybe a few words, very short. Yes, thank you very much. I was reading uh, all the questions and uh, yeah, of course the situation is uh, uh, quite difficult for uh, uh, early career researchers in particular to complete their project and uh, uh, to face this period. We are calling the member states to help us with the, the extension of the contracts in order to allow the people to stay in Europe to complete their project and uh, to help us to sustain this uh, very precarity career. Thanks a lot. Mustafa? Uh, hi, yeah. I think all the speakers already said some uh, very important point that how the research researchers are actually contributing in the broader economy with which politicians are more concerned of. And looking at the future scenario and the current situation of the world, pandemic is not the time to cut your research and innovation budget. So this is something what all the policymakers need to understand. Thank you. Gemma? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so I um, completely agree with what others have said and uh, not much to add other than let's, let's increase the dialogue. We want to hear more from early career researchers. So if you can take the time to complete the service so we can gather data and we can put something forward that is actionable and, and can and help us deal with the situation. We all know the importance this has in society and in our future. So thanks to all the having gates so far and uh, let's keep the dialogue going. Thank you. Jean-Pierre, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, I think uh, very briefly, I think uh, a battle is lost only if you don't uh, fight for it. So I think uh, there's still uh, time for more action, tr trying to be even more convincing. And to, we have to talk uh, both to politicians, but also to more widely through the media, to the general public, that this is really an, a key issue Research really depends on people, so we need to get the people properly funded. This is uh, absolutely indispensable, and uh, therefore we, we have to change the present situation, and that's only by acting together, particularly with the great help from younger people who are definitely very much hit, that we can change this. Thank you. Maybe I give the last word to Lina Galvez Munoz. Uh, we know that the European Parliament is more on, this, on our side, right? But uh, the issue is more with national governments. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, however, we are also under pressure because of the financial, um, multi-annual financial framework, and also the recovery package that needs really to be um, approved soon uh, because of, of, of people. I, I agree with all that uh, the other panelists have said. Uh, I would like just to encourage. Um, you, the, the young researchers, to keep working through associations um, because the, the, the biggest cut has been exactly here in Horizon Europe. The, there have been cut in other programs, but the biggest one has been here. Um, probably is because other parts of, of, of society has more presence in media, in, 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 in social media in general. So you we need to make also our voice very visible and i think through association and cooperation it will be easier of course at the european parliament we will be at your at your site and uh, contact us for whatever thing or action you would like to 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 to, to take on so good luck for all of us because it's a, it's a common good if we manage to have a a, a better budget and uh, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Thank you, thank you, Lina. So now I, I think I will just 
sort of conclude the game, the ball is in the game of national governments. National governments are sensitive to public opinion. Young people have an influence on public opinion as well as sort of older researchers and universities and stuff like that. So please speak out, express yourself, talk to the media, talk to the members of parliament. This is completely essential. Technically, those of you who have asked a question, a specific question, you can re-ask the question by email to the address which is on, on the chat box and we'll try to send it to whoever is the most competent. For instance, there are several questions to the, about the ERC, so we will transmit these questions to the ERC and hopefully they will be able to provide answers. Thank you to all the panelists. I think we had a very good session and thank you for the 260 or 270 people who attended this press conference.